The NVIDIA 20 series was a disappointingly expensive follow-up to the then-banger 10 series. With the 1050, 1060, and 1070 selling millions of units, the follow-ups had massive shoes to fill. Enter the RTX 2060, a 6 gb Turing-based graphics card from January 2019. A follow-up to the incredibly popular 1066 GB, this card actually had the volume to sell well, but evidently not as well as this card's follow-up, the 3060 12GB, probably thanks to its $350 launch MSRP. Let's take another look at the sometimes forgotten 2060, and see how it holds up in a variety of games across a variety of workloads. It's interesting, especially given that this is the first gen of RTX. Before we get into this video, I'd like to say not to forget to hit the like button and subscribe, so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Additionally, don't forget to leave a comment, especially if there's something I missed. I can't cover every aspect of a card in the relatively short duration of a video, but I more so wanted to discuss some benchmarks than dive into the specifications to further dissect its performance. Without anything else to say, let's dive into the test system to see how the 2060 performs in games. To give the 2060 a shot at fully stretching its legs, I've gone ahead and paired the card with an i5-13600K, a 6 plus 8 core chip clocked up to 5.4 GHz on the performance cores and 4 GHz on the efficiency cores. The performance cores in this chip will allow the 2060 to perform as well as it possibly can. The efficiency cores, in theory at least, allow the background tasks to be taken off the performance cores, freeing up additional cycles for games. After running a few tests over within i9 10850K, I found that the 13600K performs better in every scenario, and also helps to smooth out some stutters found in a lot of modern games. To keep the CPU and GPU fed with data, we've got 64 gigs of 3600 megatransfer per second DDR4, which while not as fast as lower end DDR5, will perform adequately for the purposes of this video, and won't bottleneck the CPU, especially when paired with a 2060. The specific motherboard and cooling solution are also in the description, along with the other system specs I thought were important to bring up. Without any further ado, let's dive into the RTX 2060 and see how this card performs in games. Starting off with the classic from 2019, Apex Legends performed excellently at 1080 and 1440p, and was also playable at 4K. Granted, this isn't at competitive settings, so your frame rates could look even higher than what's being shown here, but at the settings tested, it's hard to argue that things are running poorly. With a 150 FPS average and a 1% low of 115 at 1080p, the 2060 is able to return a high refresh rate gameplay experience. And if you're willing to turn the settings down, then things can look even higher than what's observed here. Moving up the resolution ladder and 1440p returned still playable results, but I'd personally prefer 1080p. With an average of 108 FPS and a 1% low of 81, it never drops down to what a lot of people would consider to be competitive, the performance is definitely lower than at 1080p. 4K returned an average and 1% low of 61 and 45 FPS, which remains playable but may not be ideal for a competitive shooter. Like I said before, turning down the settings can help to improve the performance a little, but at the end of the day I'd rather just play at 1440p and call it a day. Apex runs great on the 2060, and I'm sure whatever new game in the Titanfall universe comes out next will run just as well. Battlefield 2042, a DirectX 12 game built on the Frostbite engine, performed well at 1080p, but things kind of took a turn for the worse at 1440p and 4K. With an average and 1% low of 121 and 95 FPS respectively at 1080p, the game was very playable and ultimately a pretty good experience. However, moving to 1440p and the numbers don't look that bad, with an average and 1% low of 76 and 62. But there was just something happening in the game that I just couldn't put my finger on. The frame rate felt inconsistent, though the 1% lows don't seem to really reflect my experience. I thought I'd bring it up anyways as just a heads up, as this is probably one of the more demanding games we're testing today. 4K kind of to be expected ran on the 2060, so it didn't crash or have any DirectX errors, but the average of 38 is just too low for competitive first person shooter gameplay. Sticking to 1080p is what I would personally do if I were rocking a 2060 in this game but you can probably lower the settings and play at 1440p without too many issues considering this card is so inexpensive. Up next is an Unreal Engine 4 title, and kind of surprisingly, I don't think it ran particularly well nor particularly poorly. Borderlands 3, a first-person looter shooter, at 1080p performed decently, 
but there were some oddities that I'll bring up. The average in 1% low came in at 89 and 23 FPS, and considering we're at the high settings, I think we're running at decent performance right out of the gate. Notice that the 1% low at 1080p is significantly lower than the 1% low at 1440p, and while I wish I had an explanation as to why this is occurring, I'm not sure whether it was just an explosion filling up the screen in one instance and not the other, or maybe just looking at different geometry in game. Either way, moving up to 1440p saw the 1% low improve to 44 FPS and an average of 57. This is still playable for a single player game, but I'd prefer to play at 60 FPS when possible. So keep in mind that you can always lower the settings to claw back some performance. 4K is kind of not worth discussing beyond it can play it just because it's below 30 FPS on average, and ultimately felt kind of bad to play. Borderlands 3 was a blast on this card at 1080p and 1440p, but 4K is probably a no-go, which may be to be expected depending on who you ask. Crisis Remastered, an updated DirectX 11 version of the 2011 Classic, performed well at 1080p and 1440p, and once again kind of fell off at 4K. With an average of 177 FPS and a 1% low of 105, the 1080p performance numbers look pretty good, though like I've mentioned a few times up to this point, stick to the medium settings. Turning things up to high ultimately tanks performance at all resolutions for pretty much no reason, so sticking to the preset we're testing at is probably the way to go if you want playable performance figures on your machine. At 1440p, the average and 1% low came down to 120 and 92 FPS, which remains beyond playable, especially for a single player title. 4K, on the other hand, returned an average in 1% low of 58 and 47, which is still technically playable, but isn't where I prefer the performance of my games to be, making me once again recommend sticking to 1080 and 1440p on this card, which I didn't think I would say about a 4-year-old 60-class card, but ultimately, here we are. The next title tested is probably going to be benchmarked for the next decade, in a similar manner to Crisis. Cyberpunk 2077, an open-world first-person shooter, performed playably at 1080 and 1440p considering it is a single-player title. With an average and 1% low of 75 and 60 FPS at 1080p, Cyberpunk was playable and smooth, but I would probably still turn DLSS on or turn some settings down to claw back some more performance. At 1440p, the average of 51 and 1% low of 40 was also playable, but I'd once again turn on DLSS just to hit the 60 FPS mark. Considering the 2060 supports DLSS 2 and 3.5, it's definitely worth utilizing in this case to help boost performance. 4K wasn't playable in my opinion, with an average of 24 FPS, but once again DLSS could help here. I just think the 2060 is a bit too weak for this resolution. Overall, Cyberbug runs well at lower resolutions, but seems to follow the trend set forth by all the previous games we've tested. Playable up until we hit 1440p and then it takes a nosedive. It's worth playing this game on this card, don't get me wrong. I just avoid 4K to maintain your sanity. Fortnite, the first Unreal Engine 5 title in our test suite, ran very well at all the resolutions tested, even at 4K surprisingly. With an average and 1% low of 169 and 87 FPS at 1080p, this was 100% high refresh rate capable for competitive play. At 1440p, the 116 FPS average and 79 FPS 1% low remained playable, but we lose some of the high refresh rate capabilities in the software, which isn't really all that surprising. 4K though made me retest it a few times just to make sure the numbers were accurate, and this is what I consistently got so I'd say that it's playable, but maybe use DLSS on quality. Turning the settings down to low could also help to squeeze some extra performance from the card in some situations where it could help, but I generally found in testing that it performs well and particle effects don't generally tank the performance despite their heavy usage in this game. I'm kind of surprised considering that this is an Unreal Engine 5 title, but at the end of the day whatever is being done in this game, it runs well, and there's not that much to complain about with the 2060. Up next is the latest and greatest built on the IW 9.0 engine. Warzone 2, or now just Warzone again, performed well at 1080p with an average and 1% low of 97 and 53 FPS respectively. This is playable don't get me wrong, but I will say that you may want to enable DLSS or turn down the settings even further if you want those extra frames. 1440p was also playable, but wasn't really competitive, with an average of 62 and a 1% low of 36. 4K isn't really worth talking about besides the average came in at 35, which for most people isn't considered playable for a competitive multiplayer first person shooter. Even with DLSS at 4K, the game wasn't really that competitively viable, 
so I'd probably stick to just 1080p or 1440p with an upscaling technology turned on just to improve the 1% lows. Warzone is still a blast to play on the 2060, I'd just be more conservative with what you expect from the card. The final game on our test suite today is Rockstar's classic, Red Dead Redemption 2, a western third person shooter set in late 19th century America. At the balance preset, or what's most equivalent to the Xbox One X settings, return an average and 1% low of 98 and 78 FPS respectively at 1080p. Moving up to 1440p and the average and 1% low of 72 and 60 FPS remain playable, especially for the type of game that this is, and I actually don't think that DLSS is all that necessary up until this point. Moving up to 4K however, and that's kind of a different story. With an average and 1% low of 39 and 29 FPS, the game was still playable, but to get the most enjoyment from it I'd probably turn on DLSS or FSR to squeeze a few extra frames out of the hardware. Just to reiterate, Red Dead 2 on the 2060 performs well, but there may be some hiccups here and there with regards to textures popping in close to the player. This is probably because the 2060 is a 6GB card and it's streaming data from the CPU during gameplay but it's kind of noticeable but thankfully doesn't affect the performance of the game. It looks good and runs well, which is all I can really ask for from any game. The 2060 is built on Nvidia's Touring Microarchitecture, a follow-up to the Pascal Microarchitecture manufactured on a similar node with similar performance per watt. Utilizing TSMC's 12 nanometer class lithographic node, the actual transistor density is slightly improved on cache circuitry, but for the majority of logic it hasn't improved by much. The actual tu 106 die featured on this card is the 200A KAA1 revision, coming in with 30 SMs active. All this string of numbers and letters means is that the factory overclocking is permitted, and it probably has something to do with the quality of the actual silicon in the card. This translates though to 30 first gen ray tracing cores, 1920 CUDA cores, 120 texture mapping units, and 240 gen 2 tensor cores. These different cores and units all behave in different manners and are meant to be a division of labor inside the chip to accomplish different tasks. For example, the texture mapping units behave as buffers for texture data and are generally used when texturing rasterized geometry. The RT cores run ray intersection algorithms and are run in the pipeline either to rasterize the scene or collect lighting information. The CUDA cores themselves can run a lot of raw graphical computations such as vertex and pixel shaders, and these are utilized in tandem with other buffers and cores to produce the raw image. And then depending on the implementation, the tensor cores are used to clean up noise after the ray tracing passes. Not all algorithms utilize all the hardware present in the GPU, but this is at least what it is generally used for and what I can think of off the top of my head. The die in the 2060 features enough hardware to accelerate basic ray tracing workloads, but not really stuff in real time. I mean, in Blender the ray tracing and tensor cores really help to speed up viewport rendering, but in games there's just not enough there to actually accomplish real time ray trace shadows and ambient occlusion, reflections, or global illumination. From a microarchitectural standpoint, the CUDA cores in Turing have been beefed up from Pascal, and are now capable of concurring integer and floating point calculations. Where in Pascal the warp could only execute on a floating point or integer pipeline, now both can be active at the same time, theoretically doubling IPC. Now in reality most workloads don't do integer and floating point math concurrently, but in the cases that do, it helps performance a lot, similar to how Ampere doubled FP32 throughput on those CUDA cores, however in this case across different data types. Interestingly though, when it comes to half floats, Turing is able to process packed halves, effectively doubling FP16 throughput over standard FP32. For 3D rendering, this won't be used as often outside of variable rate shading, but for machine learning workloads, this will help to improve throughput and reduce the memory footprint. The chip itself comes stock with a little under 6.5 teraflops of FP32, which is doubled to just under 13 teraflops of packed FP16 throughput. FP64 throughput comes in at just over 201 gigaflops, which is actually similar to the FP32 throughput of the Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3. Additionally, the tensor cores on board allow for accelerated throughput of low bit depth integer workloads such as int and int4. With support for CUDNN, this card can run neural networks and accelerate some AI workloads on the specialized cores. They're half the width of Ampere tensor cores, but you're getting twice the amount of them per SM in Turing, essentially giving similar matrix performance clock per clock between the two architectures. DLSS also uses these specialized cores, and with the new DLSS 3.5 ray reconstruction feature coming to all RTX GPUs, it's going to be a nice to have, especially in more demanding games. To cache data use for use or reuse, 
Each SM is equipped with 64 kilobytes of general purpose level 1 data cache and 32 kilobytes of level 1 texture cache. This is an improvement upon Pascal's 48 kilobytes of general purpose L1 data cache, but less than Ampere's 128 kilobytes of L1 data and 64 kilobytes of L1 texture cache. I noticed that Turing's white paper is the first to mention a split level 1 cache configuration like this, and it's something that has stuck up through the current ADA microarchitecture. I suspect that these caches augment the texture mapping units and also help to speed up loading and storing textures from them. It doesn't mean that Pascal didn't feature a texture cache, it's just first mentioned in Turing, and helps to maintain high IPC within the SM. In terms of total level 2 cache, the 2060 has 3 megabytes available, which is equivalent to prior gen's GP102. This simply means that the improved CUDA cores can maintain their higher IPC thanks to an improvement to delay by moving data on die. If a warp is waiting to load data from system memory, if it instead can cache that and retrieve it much more quickly, that means the core is sitting idle for less time. With a larger L1 and L2 cache, the GPU is able to store more of this data locally on the chip, and this evidently helps performance a lot given that ADA increased cache sizes substantially over both Turing and Ampere. For comparison's sake, the RTX 3060 12GB also has 3 megs of L2 cache, meanwhile the newer RTX 4060 features 24 megs of L2, and the ARC A750 and A770 featuring 12 and 16 megabytes respectively. 3 megabytes, especially when compared to modern CPUs and GPUs, is relatively restrictive for some workloads, but for gaming it'll be perfectly fine. As for memory, the card features 32x6 or 192 bits total, GDDR6 memory controller clocked at 14 gigabit per second. This equates to 336 gigabytes per second of total bandwidth to the cores, which is significantly better than the 1060's 8 gigabit per second GDDR5, but is still behind in terms of overall bandwidth when compared to even the 2060 Super. To store data, the card is equipped with 6 gigs of memory, which in 2019 was smaller than a lot of people were comfortable with, and today is below the minimum 8 gigabyte requirement that consumers seem to desire. If you find this card for a decent price, it's really hard to complain, especially since VRAM usage is generally pretty dependent on texture resolution and running algorithms that have a big memory footprint, like ray tracing. If you're going to play esports titles at competitive settings, then 6 gigs of memory is more than enough, but for the latest and greatest it might be a bit restrictive, requiring a settings adjustment. I understand now why Nvidia decided to go with 12 gigs for the 3060, because 6 gigs is just an awkward amount in 2023. Is this a deal breaker? Well, for some maybe, but for me I'm fine with rocking medium textures so it's not a huge deal. I think it will become much more limiting in probably about a year or two though. But at this point in 2023, it doesn't cause issues that can't be fixed relatively easily. Overall though, is the RTX 2060 worth it in 2023? Well, both yes and no depending on your use case. If you want to use ray tracing, I'd honestly recommend the 3060 12GB, not because of the 12 gigs of GDDR6, but because you're getting an onboard GPU with double the FP32 data paths and improved tensor and ray tracing cores. While the 3060 is definitely more expensive than the 2060, that premium might be worth it if you plan on doing heavy ray tracing work in something like Blender or even in the new Unreal Engine games featuring Lumen. For creators, the 12 gigs of memory on the 3060 will really come in handy if you're using large data sets or video files. Focusing back on the 2060, it seems like at this point in 2023, you can find the card for between $120 to $140, including shipping, which for that price, especially at the higher end, makes it harder to recommend when the 5700 XT is similarly priced. Comparing the 5700 XT to the 2060, it comes way ahead in a lot of higher resolutions, but performs similarly at 1080p. The 5700 XT also features 8 gigs of memory, which, like I mentioned before, is a lot of people's new minimum requirement on a graphics card in late 2023. The GPU core itself on this card is still good enough to tackle 1080p gaming on most modern and almost all older titles, even though its memory capacity is a bit lacking. Keep an eye out for cheap 2060s, because they'd make a great start to a budget 1080p gaming build. So thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and click the bell icon so you'll be notified about all our future uploads. Let me know what you guys think of the 2060. Does it meet your performance expectations, or would you rather get something more powerful for a similar price? That's all I really have to say on the matter, so thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you in the next video.